everyone. I'd like to call this uh, February 5th, 2020 meeting of the James City County Planning Commission to order. Mr. Holt, would you please call the roll? Mr. Rose. Here. Mr. Rose represents the Roberts District. Ms. Leverens. Here. Ms. Leverens is an at-large member. Mr. Polster. Here. Mr. Polster represents the Jamestown District. Mr. O'Connor. Here. Mr. O'Connor is an at-large member. Mr. Croft. Here. Mr. Croft represents the Powhatan District and is this year's vice chair. Mr. Haldeman. Here. Mr. Haldeman represents the Berkeley District and is this year's chair to the Planning Commission. I'm Paul Holt, Director of Community Development and Planning for the county, and sitting to my left is Mr. Max Halaven, our Deputy County Attorney. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you. I'd like to now open it up for uh, public comment. This is for uh, an opportunity for anybody to speak to a subject not uh, I'm sorry, a subject not subject to a uh, public hearing tonight. Uh, I have one speaker card, Mr. Everson. Hey, Everson 103 Branskin Boulevard in Mr. Halderman's uh, district. Uh, I'm, here, I'm back again because you're getting ready to do the CIP. Uh, last month, the uh, school board, the city council, and the uh, board of supervisors got together, and the uh, central office indicated that they were going to um, defer middle school expansion into the 30s, uh, high school expansion about three or four years, but they're still all in on the elementary school. The reason stated for deferring the other two was flat enrollment based on the future thing. And if you look at this chart, I've highlighted it, you will see that we have flat enrollment. In fact, in the next seven years, it actually goes down. In the ninth year, it goes up. And to put that in perspective, those fifth graders were born last year. Now, the issue with the future thing still remains, number one. They, five years ago, they had Colonial Heritage showing 15% growth over five years of school-aged children. Last year, they've reduced it zero to six. This year, they increased it from six to 10. Now, I know there's one kid there. Now, I'm sure it would be grandpa they're using a grandparent's address because by covenant, they cannot live there. The fact of the matter is that they're not backing out the 14 age-restricted communities from their projections. Two, they say the average household size is 2.9. The U.S. Census 2018 says it's 2.4. That is not without significance because, as you probably well know, the central office has said that the 1,100 houses taken out of Stonehouse does not impact the future thing. Well, yeah, it does because at 0.4, that is 400 kids that won't be there using their averages, and that is almost a, almost a school. The problem still remains is that Bright Beginnings is eating up classrooms. And they show these videos, you can see it on the internet, about uh, Norge. There are nine classrooms in Norge for Bright Beginnings with 107 kids. That's 12. That's consistent with the uh, legal amount of kids per class, per teacher, I should say. If those kids were in their separate facility, that would be nine classrooms times 20, which is the low end of elementary school enrollment. That increases that capacity for elementary school by 180. They also stated that the 75% enrollment, uh, under 100% in um, James River, the 75%, they're under capacity, uh, is really 100%. Folks, they need to redistrict and they need to can this idea of a new elementary school and get right beginning facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to address the commission at this time? Seeing no one, uh, we'll move on to reports of the commission. Uh, Ms. Leverance. Policy committee met twice since our last meeting. On December 12th, the committee members present were Rich Crop, Tim O'Connor, and Julia Leverance. Staff members present were Christy Parrish, Tom Wysong, and Tammy Rosario, and John Reisinger. Ms. Parrish presented for phase three committee's consideration proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding inoperative motor vehicles and certain oversized vehicles. A recent change to the county charter granted James City County the additional authority to regulate inoperative motor vehicles for properties zoned agricultural and less than two acres and for vehicles which do not display a valid license plate or a valid inspection. 
The proposed ordinance includes so two subsections, one for properties zoned residential or commercial in which, quote, inoperative vehicle, unquote, is defined as one with an invalid license plate and an invalid inspection decal, and a second subsection for properties less than two acres zoned residential, commercial, or agricultural, which defines inoperative vehicle as one with an invalid license plate or an invalid inspection decal. The distinctions are in accordance with the wording in the state code. Violation of each subsection has different consequences, and the county will have two options when enforcing violations on residential or commercial properties less than two acres. Ms. Parrish then presented proposed language to regulate keeping and parking oversized commercial vehicles in areas zoned residential, both on private property and along residential streets. Incorporating previous policy committee discussions, as well as input from the county police department, the proposed ordinance specifies as oversized vehicles, solid waste collection vehicles, tractor trucks, tractor truck semi-trailers, tractor truck trailer combinations, dump trucks, concrete mixer trucks, or any heavy instruction, um, must be construction equipment. The committee discussed the ordinance's applicability to personal use trailers and recreational vehicles, some of which are regulated in Chapter 13. Mr. Thomas Wysong presented ORD 2019-0007, Consideration of Warehouse Storage and Distribution Centers in the Mixed Use Zoning District for Stage 3 Committee Review. In response to a question, Mr. Wysong clarified that these uses include self-storage units. Warehouse, storage, and distribution centers have been consistently permitted by right in mixed-use zoning districts. However, in August 2019, the Board of Supervisors had adopted an initiating resolution to either remove these uses from the mixed-use district or allow them as a specially permitted use. The policy committee felt that these could be valid components of certain mixed-use districts, but not the principal component. The recommended draft ordinance, which allows these structures as a specially permitted use, will come before the Planning Commission at its next meeting. And then on January the 9th, committee members present were Jack Haldeman, Rich Kopp, Rich Kropp Tim O'Connor, and Julia Leverance. Staff members present were Christy Parrish, Ellen Cook, Terry Costello, Scott White, Tom Leininger, and John Reisinger. Also present was Mr. Michael Garvin, president of the Williamsburg Area Beekeepers. Ms. Costello presented for phase one committee consideration proposed zoning ordinance amendments to address the keeping of bees in residential districts. In October 2019, the Board of Supervisors adopted an initiating resolution to address beekeeping in residential and agricultural districts. James City County already allows beekeeping in the A1, general agricultural, and R8, rural residential districts. At the state level, there have been initiatives to support beekeeping and staff's research showed that all of our neighboring localities allow beekeeping accessory to residential uses. Mr. Garvin noted that Jamestown was the site of the first beehives brought here in 1622. Committee members recommended that beekeeping be allowed countywide in all zoning districts. Discussions centered on permitting, notification, and standards, such as minimum lot size and barriers. The Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services has adopted voluntary best management practices for the operation of apiaries. The committee suggested that one quarter acre should be the minimum lot size for keeping bees and asked staff to utilize the standards in Charlottesville's and Albemarle County's ordinance when preparing language for stage two consideration. Staff will also research standards for commercial and industrial zoning districts. Mr. Reisinger presented for phase one commi committee consideration proposed zoning ordinance amendments to address combat tactical training facilities. In August 2019, the Board of Supervisors ad adopted an initiating resolution to consider amending the zoning ordinance to exclude combat tactical training facilities as a permitted use in agricultural and re residential districts and to evaluate their appropriateness as a specially permitted use in the general industrial district. These considerations are separate from the shooting ranges that are currently regulated in county ordinances. The committee recommended excluding combat tactical training facilities from all zoning districts and asked staff to incorporate provisions similar to those used by New Kent County when drafting language for stage two consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Ms. Leverance? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Polster, the DRC. 
The Development Review Committee met at 4 p.m. on 22 January 2020. The committee members present were Jack Coleman, Danny Schmidt, and Frank Polster. Staff members present, present were Thomas Weissong, Senior Planner, Ellen Cook, Senior Planner, Katie Pelletier, Planner, uh, Jose Morgado from the Stormwater, and the applicant, Holly Smith from Forge Road, LLC, uh, who participated uh, by phone. Uh, we were there to look at Conceptual Plan 190073 at 2822 and 2896 Forge Road. The applicant proposed to modify the driveway access for the subdivision that was recommended by the DRC and approved by the Planning Commission in November 2019. It permitted one shared driveway between New Parcel 1 and New Parcel 2 and another driveway to serve New Parcel 3. In this new proposal, New Parcel 2 would share access with the existing driveways on the neighboring uh, Bullet property instead of sharing a new driveway with New Parcel 1 per the original DRC recommendation. The driveways approved for New Parcel 1 and for New Parcel 3 with the understanding that the applicant hoped to access the parcel in the future via a shared driveway with the Martin Farm Estates neighborhood would remain in place. The proposal to modify is a departure from the Planning Commission approved driveway access and required the applicant to obtain an exception to Section 19-18 of the Subdivision Ordinance and a modified subdivision exception as permitted in Section 19-18 of the Subdivision Ordinance. The DRC members uh, thought that the new pro proposal, New Parcel 2, shared driveways on the Bullet property was an improvement over the configuration of the originally approved driveway. Mr. Haldeman asked if the applicant had considered connecting New Parcel 1 to the New Parcel 2 bullet share driveway. The preference of the applicant was to remain with the original separate driveway for Parcel 1. There was some discussion on exception to a standard uh, specific in Section 1973B of the subdivision ordinance, which calls for paving as opposed to gravel driveway, which was the case in two previous DRC cases on Menzel Road and 219. DRC members were in favor of the exception to section 19-73B. The DRC then voted three to zero to recommend approval to the Planning Commission for the exception uh, request section 1918 specifying one shared driveway for lots two and one and one driveway for lot three and recommend an exception to section 1973 permitting a gravel driveway for new parcel two bullet shared driveway. DRC adjourned to its next meeting uh, on 19 February 2019 at 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Polson? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is our items uh, determined not to be controversial. However, a planning commissioner may pull any item for discussion. There are two for considerations. Uh, would anybody uh, like, well, the two are uh, minutes of the December 4th, 2019 regular meeting and DRC action item, <clears throat> pardon me, C-19-0073, 2822 and 2896 Forge Road shared driveway exception. Would anybody like to pull one of these? If not, a Move motion approval to approve. of the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to public hearings. <clears throat> Pardon me. The first um, public hearing uh, is um, SUP 19-0012, Tiki Tree and Landscape. Uh, Mr. Weisong, thanks for filling in tonight. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The applicant has requested that this proposal be deferred until the March 4th Planning Commission public hearing because there are potential changes to this application that would result in a potential need to re-advertise this case. Staff does find that this request meets the intent of the Planning Commission legislation application deferral policy. As such, staff concurs with the request and recommends that the Planning Commission postpone consideration of this application to the March Planning Commission meeting. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions of Mr. Weissel? I'll open the public hearing. Um, there'll be no presentation, of course. We'll just um, have a continuance. Yes, and I do not have any speaker cards. I don't know if anybody is here to speak to the... Would anybody like to speak to this application? Seeing none, um, we'll just have a continuance, and this will be continued uh, at the next public meeting. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, public hearing is SUP-19-0025, 5403 Riverview Road Tourist Home. Ms. Costello, good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. 
Ms. Elaine Hank has applied for a special use permit to allow the operation of a tourist home at 5403 Riverview Road. The tourist home SUP will allow for the short-term rental of a four-bedroom home with no changes to the size or footprint of the home. The property is zoned A1, general agricultural, is designated rural lands in the comprehensive plan, and is located outside the primary service area, as are all surrounding parcels. Staff considered the home's location, lot size, parking provisions, and screening all to be favorable factors in the evaluation of this application. The property has an existing driveway and parking area sufficient to accommodate guests. The size of the lot and the existing vegetation provide screening for most adjacent properties. Staff is recommending conditions which are intended to mitigate the impacts of the use and preserve the residential character of the home. Such conditions include limitations on the number of rooms rented and the total number of rental occupants per stay. Staff finds the proposal to be compatible with the 2035 Comprehensive Plan, Zoning Ordinance, and Surrounding Development and recommends that the Planning Commission recommend approval of this application subject to the conditions included in tonight's packet. At this time, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, and the applicant is also available. Thank you. Any questions of the Ms. Costello? I do. Um, the applicant is also living on the property, is that correct? Yes, there's okay. two homes on the property, and she resides in one. Thanks. Which, which home is up for consideration, the one that's further set back or the one near to Riverview Road? It's the one that's further set back. Questions? Are there any disclosures by the by commissioners? Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to address the commission? Thank you. Um, have any speaker cards? No? No speaker cards. Would anybody like to address the commission on this matter? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Discussion? Or a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to um, motion make a motion to approve SUP-19-0025-5403. Riverview Road Tourist Home. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Holt, please call the roll. Ms. Leverens. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. No. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Croft. Aye. And Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next up is SUP 19 0028 6621 Old Moortown Road, the Straight Gate Temple Expansion. Uh, Ms. Cook. Good evening. Thank you also for filling in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Mr. Edward Rose has submitted an application for a place of public assembly at 6221 Old Moortown Road. The property is currently zoned R2 general residential and is designated low density residential on the 2035 comprehensive plan land use map. The existing structure will be rehabilitated prior to occupancy and the master plan permits an additional, an additional 1,771 square feet of building area, bringing the total to 3,271 square feet. With the new addition, seating for up to 160 people is planned. Site improvements will include additional parking spaces and stormwater management facilities. Staff finds this proposal to be compatible with the surrounding development and consistent with the 2035 comprehensive plan. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend approval of this application to the Board of Supervisors subject to the proposed conditions. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have and the applicant is also available. Thank you. Any questions? This may more appropriately be to the applicant, but I just wanted to clarify there's, um, I think you said 32 parking spaces and 160 um, congregants in the church. And so I'm assuming where it says the, there'll be a worship service um, Sunday mornings from 9 to 2, that means there'll be multiple services to make sure that the parking will accommodate. And then the same for the Wednesday evening um, service from 7 to 9. 
And again, this may be more appropriate for the applicant, but I didn't know if you had discussed that um, during your review. Well, I'll let uh, Pastor Rose address that question. Okay. Uh, I have one question. I should know the answer to this, but I don't. Um, this, the um, site plan must be approved within 36 months. Is there any <coughs> such requirement for construction to begin? Um, no, and the condition is that currently is written. Um, it just addresses the site plan time frame. Thank you. Um, any disclosures by commissioners? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Um, would the applicant like to make a presentation? Yes, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Edward Rose, and the address is uh, 6221 Old Moortown Road. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think you had a question. Um, we have only having one service on Sundays and uh, one service doing on Wednesday. And right now, there's only about maybe 20 of us. So the 160 congregant is uh, future if we uh, happen to uh, uh, have those many people to join our assembly. But right now, we just want to utilize the building as is, just renovate it so we have somewhere to assemble. And then um, down the road, if we uh, grow or increase our membership, then we would like to uh, extend the building. And you'll have to revisit the parking uh, availability at yes, that sir. point in time. Okay. Yes, sir. And I think we'll do that on the site plans when we uh, 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 produce our site plans, submit our site plans to the uh, commission. Thank you. Anybody else have a question of the applicant? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, any speaker? Seeing none, would anybody like to address the commission on this matter? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Discussion? I ask you a quick question of Mr. Holt. Um, what we have in here is an in and out on um, Four Town Road, and one of the conditions is to have um, a warrant done on on a turn or turn lane or, or taper um, if if that was poss if if that was required um, would they have the ability to reformat the entrance onto um, the side lane I think what is it curry lane um, to change that in in the event that it's required, but it becomes a, an obstacle, can they change the site plan to come in off of Curry Lane? And I would, I would strongly recommend that they explore that if that comes up. This being a corner lot is very advantageous. It gives them that opportunity for sure. So what that would mean is if they were to explore that when the site plan comes in over the next three years, the first step would be that master plan consistency determination. And again, if, if that was the only change and there weren't significant impacts or other um, sort of cascading changes on site, if, if it was pretty straightforward, that, that could be something that staff um, could approve administratively. If not, there would be the appeals process to the DRC. So there would be a couple of options that they could explore, a couple different things that could be short of needing to fully amend the SUP. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a motion? I'll Please make shine. the motion to approve JCC's SUP 19-0028. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holt, please call the roll. Ms. Leverins. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Kropp. Aye. And Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, SUP-19-0029. 4451 Long Hill Road Life Church and Daycare Program. Ms. Costello, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Ms. Lara Hale has applied for a special use permit to allow for the existing church and daycare located at 4451 Long Hill Road. This is the current location of Life Church. 
The property is zoned R8, rural residential, and designated low density residential on the comprehensive plan and is located inside the primary service area. Surrounding development includes Windsor Forest, Seasons Trace, and Lafayette High School. The Christian Life Center, known as Life Church, has occupied this facility since March 2000. In 1998, when the original site plan was approved, houses of worship were a permitted use in the R8 zoning district. The zoning ordinance was amended in December of 1999 to require a special use permit for this use. Due to this change, the church is currently considered non-conforming. The daycare program proposed will have a maximum of 30 children with eight staff members. The age range of the children will be from infant to 36 months. The hours of operation will be from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. three days a week. These hours also, inclu also include the pickup and drop off times. The daycare will operate within the current facility and there are no external changes such as outdoor playgrounds proposed. The resolution before you tonight will permit the church as it exists and the proposed daycare. Staff finds that this proposal to be compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the 2035 comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend approval of this application to the Board of Supervisors subject to the proposed conditions. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and the applicant is also available. Thank you. Questions? Just for clarification, I mean, it's, it's open, what, three days a week and only from 8 to 1? Is, is that the operating hours we're talking about for the facility? The actual daycare will be open from 9.30 to 12.30, and then we allowed an hour for pickup and drop-off time. Three days a week? Three days a week. Thank you. Is there a reason for the condition? We wanted to make, ensure that it wouldn't interfere with any traffic from Lafayette High School at that intersection. Well, will that be a signalized intersection nearby at Lafayette? In part of the long, I know it's part of the Long Hill plan, but is it expected yeah, so any time in the near future? Um, so probably not in the near future. Um, there's no funding uh, identified for a signal. But if you'll remember from the Long Hill Road corridor study, between the high school and the entrance to Seasons Trace for that stretch, um, there was not consensus and there was not an easy answer on how to treat that as part of the Long Hill Road corridor study. The entrances are too close and there's just a lot of traffic coming from each. So for those two specific entrances, the, long, the adopted Long Hill Road corridor study had um, recommended in an appendix something like eight or nine different possibilities and the recommendation was to at such point before we really proceeded with Long Hill Road Phase 2 that there be further charrettes, further conversations with the schools, further conversations with the community to refine those down to ones that, that ended up being acceptable and would provide the best long-term solution. So those conversations have not happened yet. So it's still a little bit in flux what the exact improvements in there should really be to meet the needs of the community. <clears throat> I'm just puzzled with the condition piece because I drive that road all the time in those hours and between the bus drivers getting out to stop the traffic and the police out there uh, for it at both times. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's better than a signalized piece. So I, I don't quite understand the condition, but that's another issue, I guess. How does the applicant feel about it? They were okay with it. So if they could open up earlier, they would? Well, she had set the hours from 9.30 to 12.30, and then we, we extended them an hour before and an hour after for drop-off and pickup. Be able to ask her. Mm -hmm. Are there questions? Any disclosures? None. I'll open the public hearing. The applicant like to uh, make a statement? You state your name and address for the record. Sarah Hale, 140 Country Club Drive. And I just wanted to say hi. 
I'm going to be <laughs> the director there if everything goes well. So I just wanted to introduce myself, and I'm here to answer any questions if you guys have them. I thought it was a great idea for a mom uh, or a single father to be able to take the morning off yeah. and go and do the shopping and have, you know, maybe a lunch hour type thing. Yeah. Which is why I don't understand the, you know, why you agreed to that kind of an hour. If, if, you, if you had your druthers, what would they be? Yeah, we set, before we even came to the county, we had already talked about 930 to 1230. But that was just something when we met as a church, we were like, hey, we want to do it for just a few hours. Um, and so we just already came up with 9.30 to 12.30, so we were fine with that. Um, and, and I don't know. I don't know a ton of how stuff works. Um, so I, I, Right, so the condition like holds me to that. So I don't know if that's something in the future, if we would want to open from at like 8 instead of 9. Um, but we set 9.30 to 12.30 before we even came. So I know we're going to stick with those hours for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Any other questions? So, just I personally am not a fan of putting our restrictions on on businesses. Yeah. So, um, I mean, would you foresee for your group? I mean, wanting to do like an evening program and those types of things. Um, I just. I don't think we do anything at night um if anything in the future it would be expanding hours um but it would only be like an hour before or an hour longer like expanding more to fall in line with the rest of like um the non-exempt centers around here or the preschools in the future if we ever did but i don't not anything in the evening <coughs> But I agree. I didn't even know there was a thing of like putting hours on things and such. So <laughs> <laughs> Good. here we are. <laughs> what about extra days? Could you envision that? Five yes. days a week instead of three. Right. In the few, I, in the few, two years down the line, maybe I know for a fact that they wanted to start small and they wanted to do a very like condensed for the foreseeable future for the next couple of years. And then if we reevaluate it and it went well and we were full all the time to say, well, maybe we should open it up like Monday through Friday. Um, but that wouldn't be for another couple of years. And of course, just to con put it in context, there's two options um, the way I look at it. One would be for the Planning C Commission to recommend that that uh, particular condition on operating hours be withdrawn from the SUP conditions, recommending it forward to the Board of Supervisors, or if the applicant is fine with it now and the foreseeable future, the applicant always does have a remedy to come in and modify SUP conditions, right, Mr. Holt? Yes, absolutely. And again, the Planning Commission has other options. Again, I think in the condition, staff had matched up the three days a week just because that matched what the application was. Right. And, and so that was our starting point there. And really the hours were to just to avoid the um, any traffic impacts with school um, starting in the morning or letting out in the afternoon. So, you know, that the, the hours and the number of days of the week are two distinct things. Um, the number of days of the week is, is not really designed to mitigate potential traffic impacts or conflicts with school um, starting <coughs> or ending during the day. So, you know, that could be an option that the Commission wants to consider. This is a follow-up. Is, is it possible uh, that the remediation that she could take would be if it was approved by the Planning Commission and if it was approved by the Board of Supervisors as is, doesn't she have the remediation to come in through the DRC and through you to make that, or does it have to go back through the complete legislative uh, piece? No, it would have to go all the way back through the legislative because these are very these are discrete um, times in here. This, this isn't um, uh, something that would be subject to modification but for the board action. So the options that we're talking about here are do the open-ended day piece, Keep with the hours and then with the notion that you could come back in when you were sure and say, yes, we want to do that. Yeah. Or expand the days. Expand or you the could days. Do, yeah. Take, yeah. Take, eliminate the limitation on the three days a week. So you've got some options there. I could, I could support that, eliminating right. the restriction on three days a week, but I think the hours probably should stay put for now. Yes. Are you okay with that? I agree, yes. I would agree with let's keep the hours for now and I can come back in. 
if we do change them. Um, but yeah, we can definitely putting taking that condition off for the days of the week. I mean, that doesn't change. It's so we just say Monday through Friday, and then the option if we did want to go Monday through Friday, we could stick with the same hours, but I wouldn't have to come back through. Right. Okay. Yes. I like that idea. Keep the times due to the traffic considerations at the high school, um, but open it up to all five days so that you don't have to come back if you ever want to expand it to yeah. five days, because that's not a traffic consideration. Uh, any further questions? <clears throat> um, where are we here? Um, speakers' cards, anybody? Uh, th thank you very much. Um, no, no speaker cards. <laughs> Would anybody like to speak to the commission on this matter? Uh, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Discussion? Or a motion? I would, I would support it without any restrictions on hours. I just think it's um, unfair to base the restrictions on potential traffic issues in taking a new business and tell them they have to go back through the legislative process just to amend the hours I, I think it's just over burdensome and I could support it without the the hours of operation in there as a condition I'm more inclined to just keep the hours in place and open up the days five days well, the same way well I travel that day off that road all the time. I mean, it, and the kids get out at 3.30, so it's not the afternoon that matters at all. And in the morning, they're all making that right-hand turn to get into the school uh, for it, and, and there is somebody out there. So the traffic congestion at 20 miles an hour isn't really an issue uh, for it. And, and so the principle, I think, that, that I get from Tim, and I kind of agree that, you know, doing mommy may I for a business and making them come back through, I you know, on something like this, I, I don't. I don't support that. I do like the day piece open. The other thing is that if, if we expand it to all day, we're not just talking about a day out. I mean, the, the whole point here, as I understand it, is is for temporary drop off the kids and go get some errands done in peace and quiet rather than a daycare center. Right. I just, we talk about how these are are more or less permanent decisions so again you've got a business model that says this is what we want to do right now and which is fine but if it's successful or it grows why do we want to hamstring you know handcuff a a, a potential growth in in business and the opportunity to take and employ people full-time versus part-time and you know go through the extra expense of having to come back through the legislative process just to ask to extend their hours. I, I just, I think it's ridiculous myself. Question? Um, just go, go on. I'm not, since I don't have um, students or children in uh, Lafayette High School, I'm just curious as to um, the assessment as to what the traffic conditions are during the day uh, in front of Lafayette, uh, realizing that the Long Hill Road piece is going to weigh in further down the road. I mean, is there a, 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 an issue or are there sufficient road crossing and traffic control measures currently in place in front of Lafayette High School? I'm looking to... Um, well, uh, so just generically, um, there is no funding on the horizon to either do the widening or to do any other physical improvements. Um, I do think the ability, should the, should the police department have the ability to put an officer out there to direct traffic, um, may be a short-term solution. Obviously, there's pros and cons to that. You, you, there's, there's safety of the officer. There's how they allocate resources. There are a lot of things that go into that. So, um, you know, currently with the high school schedule, school's going to start about 7.20 in the morning and let out about 2.30 in the afternoon, but for sports. Th my experience, I'm sorry. My, my experience is, is that there is a police officer in the afternoon. 
uh, that, that bus has come out the other side of the high school, not not the one up by Season Trace on the other side. The bus drive there is somebody, one of the bus drivers that comes out and stops the traffic to let the buses go either left or right. Okay, and the same thing is true in the morning. And and people are pretty good about that 20 mile uh, piece, uh, which starts uh, way up above the church, as a matter of fact, uh, of where they're located uh, on this map. So uh, anyhow. Um, for the number of people that they're talking about and for, at, for their startup on it and what may grow. I mean, when I look down the road at the Lutheran church uh, that's uh, down there, they've expanded big time. I mean, we've seen the latest one, not only for a church extension, but their childcare. Uh, and so it wouldn't surprise me at, at all in the near future that that kind of a service is something that they would have. And so it, whether you look at it as a business model or not, child care and these sort of services are something the community needs. Well, one of the things that I consider when looking at these conditions, uh, looking at the SUP conditions, is what are the current conditions uh, that are in play right now. And it, it certainly seems to me that traffic is being managed. You know, granted that Long Hill Road is a busy road, which is why it's going through a widening project. Uh, but there are, whether it be bus drivers or police officers, the traffic is being controlled and managed. And so based on that, uh, and the fact that the applicant from the get-go before realizing that there were SUP conditions to deal with um, had only planned to do 930 to 1230 for their their daycare program um, my inclination would be just to um, eliminate that condition two hours of operation and and because it, it seems like we're trying to trying to fix a problem that doesn't really exist right now um, at that spot Other discussion? Motion? Make a motion uh, to approve JCC SUP 190029 without the SUP conditions for day or time. Oh, please call the roll. Um, Mr. Chairman, just for purposes of the minutes and records and everything else, if I could clarify the motion, Mr. Polster, would your recommendation be striking condition number two entirely, or would it simply leave only the first part of that sentence to say the daycare shall be operated within the existing place of assembly, period. Period. We'll probably just fix the title of that because hours of operation, we, right. would, we would tweak that correspondingly, but just wanted to make sure that that was clear for the record and that that was indeed your motion. Roll roll. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Ms. Leverance. No. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Rose. Mr. Krop. Aye. And Mr. Haldeman. No. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Uh, next up, SUP 19-0030-124B Cooley Road, rental of rooms. Mr. Weissong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Mrs. Eileen Damari and Mr. Gilbert Damari have applied for a special use permit to allow the short-term rental of one bedroom in a caretaker-occupied single-family home at 124B Cooley Road. The property is zoned R1 Limited Residential, is designated for low-density residential on the adopted comprehensive plan land use map, and is within the primary service area. Staff has found several favorable factors for this application. The proposal is for the rental of only one bedroom, which is less than the maximum of three rooms permitted within the special use in the R1 zoning district. Unlike a tourist home use, the caretaker for this use will live on site. There is adequate off-street parking provided on site, and the proposal is consistent with some of the recommendations of the comprehensive plan, such as having limited traffic impacts. However, the subject property is located on a local road. The adopted comprehensive plan recommends that this use be located on collector or artillery roads at intersections. Furthermore, unlike other past applications in areas designated for low density residential, the subject parcel is fully integral to an existing neighborhood. Renters traveling to and from this property will have to drive through the neighborhood. Staff has concerns that the particular size and configuration of this parcel could result in adjacent properties being impacted by renters with different hours or noise levels than traditional long-term residents. 
For these reasons, staff is unable to recommend that the Planning Commission recommend approval of this application. Should the Commission recommend approval, staff has provided proposed conditions to mitigate impacts. Unfortunately, the applicants were not able to be here this evening, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have for staff. Thank you. Any questions for staff? So currently there is a person that lives there uh, long term as a long term rent, um, tenant and this application would be for one master bedroom to be made available on Airbnb um, for uh, somebody to use. So the long term tenant is the caretaker? Yes ma'am. Okay. So the owners are, are not on the premises? Yes ma'am. Correct. So we're talking one room in addition to the long term caretaker? So yes, the one bedroom would be available on Airbnb. And the long-term tenant is sort of a separate issue in terms of leasing. I just follow up a, a little bit. Um, looking at the four conditions uh, listed in the staff report for the comp plan, I'm gathering that um, the only uh, condition that really doesn't fully apply or doesn't apply is generally uh, saying that generally located on collector or artillery arterial roads at intersections. Um, so had, am I correct in saying that that is the only pause that staff had for not recommending approval? If, if, it was, if that road was classified as an arterial or collector, you would have recommended approval of the application? That was a major consideration from the comprehensive plan perspective. I think the other thing we looked at was the actual location of the lot within the neighborhood, which is pretty central to the neighborhood. And the actual lot's configured in a way where this house is located um, pretty close to some other residences. So that was another concern that was separate from the comprehensive plan uh, that we took into consideration. Okay. There was one other that in your staff report, you talked about restricting any removal of um, the rear shrubbery or trees in the back there. I looked at that property, the trees and all the rest of it are mature or large. I mean, there's nothing there that shields or buffers the adjoining neighborhoods. Did I get the wrong property? No, um, you do have to drive around the back of the house. I don't know if you went that far into it, but behind this house, there is some mature plantings that the uh, property owners put in to screen the house that's behind them. So that's what that condition is referring to. Um, I know that number of the um, adjacent properties have submitted le letters of support. Um, was a letter of support or has approval, any comments come from the property that this is behind? I don't believe so. I, I would okay. have to check that letter again. I um, suspect that's number 122 and I didn't see that. Yeah, I would have to look at the letter. I know staff did receive a phone call. I don't believe it was from a neighbor that was immediately adjacent, but in the neighborhood expressing concern about the potential of somebody potentially driving an RV onto the property. So if somebody wanted to use Airbnb and they were in an RV, there was concern about um, would they be parking that RV on the street? And our condition would restrict that from street parking, uh, but they would be permitted to park it on the property. There's no homeowner, homeowners association in that neighborhood, is that right? I, I don't believe so, no ma'am. Currently, we preclude multiple contracts for rental of this type of use, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't I don't understand how we can do this, even given these con conditions, because you already have one rental contract in place for the caretaker. So condition number four says there won't be simultaneous rentals under separate contracts, but in essence, that's what we're approving. Because the rental of rooms in the SUP is for the transient stay. The long-term, the yearly lease, six-month lease, yearly lease is not an SUP. That would, that would not create that conflict. So the way we currently approve them, is that just for transient stays it for to preclude multiple rentals questions not a question but 
Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Um, would anybody, we don't have a speaker card. Would anybody like to address the commission on this matter? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Uh, there's no applicant. Um, I got the speaker cards out of order, but uh, we, we have no speaker cards, no speakers. I'll close the public hearing and discussion. I just, I'm just sort of thinking out loud right now. I drove by there this afternoon, and um, a couple things struck me, and I, and I do realize that this does not meet all the conditions in the, in the comp plan. I, I thought Cooley was a fairly wide residential street, um, and it was maybe a quarter of a mile from the intersection to Route 5. It was a straight shot. And then I'm also looking at the uh, condition that says only one bedroom uh, will be leased uh, beyond that of the, the caretaker. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, what's the difference between renting this room out to one person versus if a family lived there and had an additional family member that was of driving age and also came and went. You know, there wouldn't be uh, that much impact. Uh, well, there'd be, I mean, that would be the expected impact on a residential neighborhood is when you have multiple drivers in a house. And so um, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to land on this right now because uh, I am concerned about the fact that it's not fully in compliance with the standard set in the comprehensive plan. but because this is a, a little bit unique with limiting it to only one rather than a maximum of, what is it, five uh, bedrooms that could be rented out, uh, four or five bedrooms, I, I'm thinking there's a self-contained um, uh, measure in place there. But I, uh, as I said, I'm just thinking out loud. But that's what struck me about it when I drove around that particular neighborhood this afternoon. Perhaps to clarify, the limitation would be three. Three, three bedrooms, bedrooms, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Different category for the five bedrooms. Yeah. If the applicant were here, I would congratulate them on coming forward because I understand that this has been listed on Airbnb for several months now. Um, and I, I, I hesitate to oppose it because I want the message to go out that people do need to come forward if they are listing on Airbnb or, or whatever for transient rentals and, and do it right. But I'm, I'm seeing ordinance creep here and I really am uncomfortable with the precedent of any kind of transient rental in a neighborhood. I mean I, I opposed the one that was down in, at the end of Neckerland for similar reasons. I just I, I just remain obstinate. I don't feel that these type of uh, room rentals are in keeping with our comp plan in regards to um, affordable housing opportunities. I think in a lot of ways they remove affordable housing options, whether it's rental or purchase. Um, I don't think that they go a long way in terms of supporting sports and agritourism. And, you know, I don't think it supports creating full-time jobs with benefits. And these are all parts of our comp plan that, that you know, we talk about striving towards. So um, I, I remain opposed. I find um, the standards that we talk about as far as having uh, negative impacts on nearby properties to um, not be always equally applied, in my opinion. Um, I, I just think we've, so, you know, I just remain opposed and on this application. I, I've been uneasy about these for the last year. Several online, offline discussions about it and hope that uh, we seriously do use this comp plan to relook at the issue. Especially about, uh, I think the non-arterial road was in my mind to keep it out of subdivisions that are already there. The same reason uh, for the Neckel land. Uh, for it. But I had no problem applying that same thing to the Ironbound, and we've approved, what, three or four here in the last two years. So I, I, I'm, I'm uneasy about this uh, neighborhood piece of that uh, for it. And, and if I remember correctly, this same neighborhood 
had a problem when we were talking about putting a halfway house in it. Uh, so um, for that reason, I'm not going to support this. Other discussion or I'll make a motion not to approve SUP 19-0030. So again, to be clear, a yes vote will be a vote not to recommend approval. Uh, Mr. Holt, please call the roll. Ms. Leverance. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Croft. Aye. And Mr. Haldeman. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, that's it for uh, public hearings. We'll move on to planning commission considerations, of which there are none. Sir, I don't have it. And planning director's report, Mr. Holt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Other than what's been included in your agenda packets, I didn't have anything additional, um, but could certainly help answer any questions you may have. Questions? One curiosity. Um, Before we leave the public hearing, I don't think the commission actually took a vote on postponing the, um, the talk. Tiki SUP. Yeah, beg your pardon, Mike. Yeah. Oh, um, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Laban. Um, call the roll, Mr. Holt. Thank so, um, would somebody make a motion to postpone that to our March, regularly scheduled March meeting? Can I just clarify? So, the postponement was due to additional conditions imposed by st or requested uh, the, by staff? Or? No, the applicant needed to um, uh, reevaluate a couple of additional factors that are going into the application, and it may be that we need to re-advertise this case because one of their options that they're considering is adding an additional property into the application that was not advertised as part of this one. And this is currently the property on Centerville Road that has been operating on conforming fashion to put it nicely it's not the correct term but yes that has well, been operating for quite it, right yes. so i would recommend not deferring the application got a motion so i'll move that for sup 19-0012 we don't grant a deferment in there but it's up to the Commission okay. um, call the roll please mr. Holt so again the motion as I understand it mr. O'Connor is to not recommend deferral and so a yes vote would be to uh, proceed with the discussion and further potentially further action on this tonight another question I'm sorry um, so if we vote uh, to not defer It'll have to be re-advertised um, and brought back in this form or some other form. Depends on the, the on how the applicant resubmits the application. Mm -hmm. Have to make that determination when they resubmit. Before calling the roll, just sort of a, a discussion. I'm a little concerned with a with a, a, a vote to. Uh, not defer because I feel that we don't have the benefit of, of really the staff input or the applicants input as to what the full extent is and the reasons behind it and and so on and so forth uh, so I I'm a little concerned about about that aspect of it but um, anyway that I just want I'm to not sure I understand the implications um, so if we vote not to defer do we make a decision tonight on this application those of it in some form or fashion those options include yay nay or you'd have to you'd have to vote on it. if you don't recommend to defer it, your only other action would be to um, make a recommendation to the board to, for approval or denial I can some is other that, recommendation is it because I saw the recommendation to defer I didn't pay any attention to it you can overrule it but I I feel strongly about this application, so I'm just. Um, Mr. Holt, would you please call the roll? Ms. Leverance? Oh. No. Oh. Okay, I wanted to make sure what a no or a yay was. A no is okay. No. 
Oh, a, a yes. Okay. Are you okay, Mr. Polster? No. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Rose. No. Mr. Kropf. No. Mr. Haldeman. No. Motion. Motion. I'll make a motion to defer SUP 19-0012 Tiki Treescape and Landscape to the March 4th Planning Commission meeting. Mr. Holt, please call the roll. Ms. Leverins. Aye. Mr. Polster. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. No. Mr. Rose. Aye. Mr. Krupp. Aye. And Mr. Haldeman. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, yes. Mr. Deputy County Attorney. Together. Yes. <laughs> Um, but with that, Mr. Chairman, we did not uh, did not have anything additional as part of the planning director's report. Thank you, Planning Commission. I'm sorry. I was going to ask one other quick question. Um, the all the activity that's going on at Anderson's Corner with land disturbing is is there something behind that, or is that just a dumping ground for dirt? Uh, I think it's a it's a permitted stockpile area. So. All right, so will it be a stockpile and removed, or is that going to be sort of permanent? That level of detail, let me look into. I can get back to you on. Thanks. One thing, if I could just add, uh, I've had several conversations with Ms. Cook on this particular project, and apparently it's, it's a 2008 land disturbing permit that has just been activated, and um, it does not include any structure or parking facilities on the property. So anything other than moving the dirt around, my understanding from talking to staff is that uh, would require a, a separate application and a, a separate process, but that right now, to Mr. O'Connor's point, it, it's just moving the dirt around a bit. But again, it's um, secondhand from what I got from staff. A planning Commission discussion and requests. Um, Mr. Polster, you have Board of Supervisors duty? No. He does, but there's, there are no PC or land nothing, use nothing related do, items. Right. Well, so <laughs> you drew a good straw. I guess. I'm going to opt to watch it at home. Okay. Um, <laughs> under this category, I just wanted to um, mention that this community participation team for the comprehensive plan revision has been working for the better part of a year and um, uh, 10 residents, volunteers with staff, and have put together a um, significant report, I think it's available online, um, that details uh, all their um, engagement efforts um, to elicit input from the community. Uh, I think they've done a terrific job. Uh, uh, they've worked hard, they've taken uh, numerous different um, steps to get people to um, um, make inputs and so I just uh, I think the county should be indebted to the uh, to the residents who stepped forward and taken this on um, the effort continues of course uh, the uh, engage 45 2045 website uh, still has uh, a facility for residents to um, make comments on uh, on their priorities for the comprehensive plan and there will be several other uh, public initiatives so um, that's it for that anybody else for questions uh, may I please have a motion to adjourn a move all in favor aye, aye.